I heard about a country song. I don't know the song and I don't know the artist, but I was uh, um, hooked by the lyrics. Um, Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. Everybody wants to heaven, wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, So heaven's been on my mind (laughs) as we've been looking at the Pure Land. Um, And, you know, I grew up in a a way of thinking that there really is this beautiful picture that mom and dad and the grandparents and our dog and everybody who's gone before will be waiting on the shore of the other side. And we just, you know, move in that direction. Even Venerable Tarpa's grandmother, right, had a near-death experience and had this vision that was so clear for her that her parents or, you know, loved ones anyway, were waiting for her across the shore. It's very vivid and very appealing. Um, You know, and unfortunately, I just don't believe it. (laughs) So, you know, here I am, dressed like this, doing something else. But um, so I was surprised actually when um, we began to do this Amitabha practice, how much doubt began to come up for me based on my you, you know previous training and so forth. So the antidote to doubt is study, <laughs> learn, reflect. So I've really been spending uh, my time thinking about this. So today, really, all I have to offer is some reflections of where that has taken me, because I suspect I'm not the only one. Um, So I hope this is useful. I first heard about this Pure Land idea of, you know, aspiring to be born in the Pure Land. I mean, I've known about Pure Land Buddhism and Pure Land practices, but a couple of um, retreats ago, several years ago now, I was studying a a commentary on a, a sadhana, a deity practice by Gaelic Rinpoche. And in this text, there's a section where he really goes off on encouraging, kind of driving his students to aspire for rebirth in the pure realm. I'd never seen a lama say that out loud, ever. And I was really taken with it. What he said was, what Venerable has said, basically, he said, if your mind isn't stable enough, if you don't have the, the development yet to to um, be able to propel your own rebirth, then the safest thing to do is to aspire to be born in the pure realm because who knows where you're going to end up. Even you have really good, you know, you're making good karmic connections. We don't know what's going to ripen and you don't know where you'll go and you don't know what you'll be attracted to in your new rebirth. So if you really want to continue practicing the Dharma, do that. So, you know, I was quite taken with that. It made sense to me a lot, actually. So again, I was really surprised when this doubt came up. Um, but then in listening to these teachings that I mentioned that Geshe Thupen Pelsung came, gave, he, I don't know, I haven't gotten so far, but I suspect he was wrestling with his doubt too. But he says, okay, if you want to look at this in, in terms of reasoning, we have to ask three important, well, four important questions. First question, is a pure realm exist? Second question, if it does exist, is it essential to be born there? Third question is, if it's essential can be born there, can I be born there? (laughs) And then the fourth question becomes, then what are the practices? What do I need to do in order to bring that about? So in this first point, does a pure realm exist? A couple of things have come to my mind on that reflection. One was a very mundane kind of thing, really. Um, And many years ago now, 1999, His Holiness was teaching in Bloomington, Indiana for 10 days. Some of you were there. Um, It was a big outdoor thing. They made a big tent. People were living in, um, like we were in a campground. People were in hotels and buses were busing people in. I think there were about 4,000 people there for this teaching. Five, 5,000 people for this teaching. Good sized group. The security was very tight and very kind of weird, if you remember. The first, you know, they sent this thing, this, you can have bags of this size, you can bring in this, you can bring in that. So everybody was trying to comply, and the, the um, security people were kind of tight and tough the first few days. And it was like the rules changed every day. So you'd show up thinking that you had followed the rules, but the rules had changed overnight, and, you know, there wasn't any internet. <laughs> there was no email in those days. So about the fourth day, 
we all showed up and we're in line to go through the check. And then the, they've decided that, you know, yesterday we used to be able to have notebook sized bags. Today, you're only allowed in with a bag this big. So everybody's like, what? My lunch is in here. My water is in here. I'm like, la, 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 la. But I saw in front of me in the line, you know, there was that. <laughs> and then I saw all these monks and nuns, mostly Western, shrug and go, OK. And they all took their jolas and put them on the fence on the outside of the teaching area. I just left in there. I was like, I mean, I have my little backpack. I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> But, you know, what's the choice? I'm not going to get on the bus and go back to the, to the campground and leave my bag. So, okay, I took my wallet out, I took the water out, I took my notebook out, and I put my bag there. The teaching was wonderful. I don't have the kind of memory that can tell you what we had that morning. But uh, at the end of that teaching, we all came out. All the bags were still there. Everybody picked up their bag where they had left it, took out their lunch, ate their lunch, and the day went on. I was blown away. Imagine living in a world where the trust is so great and people's ethical conduct is so pure that you can leave your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be there when you come back. So this story came to mind as I was thinking about the Pure Lands. Like, oh, that's a place where people hold ethical discipline to the point where you don't have to worry about somebody ripping off your lunch. You don't have to worry about someone harming you because we're all practicing non-harming. And then I thought, I live in a place like that already. <laughs> Duh. Now, it's also true the helping hand will sometimes come and move your stuff. <laughs> in fact, often I'm going to make signs that say, leave this here, just to have in my pocket so that someone doesn't come clean up while I've gone to the bathroom. <laughs> but that aside, I already live in a place like that. So what am I skeptical of? What is my skepticism in terms of being in a pure land or a pure place where ethical discipline is you know, the root? And so we live in a, in a climate of non-harming. So that was one point. I thought, OK, let's start with the mundane and grow our view of what's possible. Because you're already experiencing it and not even seeing it. And then the second thought I had on that particular question of, you know, is it possible, is um, I'm reading the, the Amitabha Sutras to convince myself. It's like, OK, do I believe in the Mahayana Sutras in general? Do I have faith in the Prajnaparamita, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, in general? Do I have faith in everything that Maitreya has said about the powers of a Buddha, and what's in the mind of a Buddha, and the paths of the bodhisattvas? Well, yes. And why, if the Amitabha Sutra is spoken by the Buddha, would I doubt this? So I'm working on that one, too. Why, why would I do that? So then, this other thing about, is it essential? Um, then I go back to Gaelic Rinpoche where in this thing, when he's talking to people about when you die, he says, when you know your time has come, the point is you must cut. He means cut attachment. Whether you've made a mess of your life or you've done it good, whatever, it's history. There is no time for you to redo it. There is no check and second chance. So you have to be absolutely clear. You must go. Right? At the point of death, go. You have to keep your chin up and not be afraid. And he said the way to keep your chin up is to focus on where you are going. You put your focus on the Pure Land. Think about all these great beings who are there. Nagarjuna's there. Amitabha's going to teach you. I'm sure the Taras hang out there. Chenrezig is there. All these people that are going to be there waiting on the other shore. <laughs> not only think you're going there but you almost have to hypnotize yourself to make yourself believe that you are going there so you are going there he says again to make it absolutely clear if you have to go you have to go and the way to raise your chin up and look forward is to go to the pure land and don't look back 
now. Looking back is our problem. He says we have children so that we can look back. We build monasteries and temples (laughs) so that we can look back. We build a legacy so that we can look back. He said every one of those things is attachment. And at the moment of death, attachment is what will propel us into another rebirth in the desire realm. Don't look back. Go straight to the pure land. And Amitabha, as it turns out, huh, coincidentally, his specialty is helping us to overcome attachment, right? Within the five Dayani Buddha families, that's his role. So is it essential to be born in the pure land? I think so. I'm beginning to think so. And is it possible? Well, you know, Gaelic Rinpoche has laid out the schema here, and it seems pretty clear. Could I do it? Well, why not? Why not? And then Geshe Pelsung kind of winds it up again. I'm going to go back to him. He says, if you think maybe it's possible, maybe, maybe, we should definitely engage in practices that create the causes. He said, we do many things in life that we don't know the actual outcome. We get an education, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We might start a business, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. You know, we might build a monastery, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. But we are propelled, without really knowing the outcome, we go forward. So with that same mind of, well, maybe, but with the determination, then we go forward to aspire to to be reborn in in the pure realm. He says if we have kind of like equal doubt, Maybe there's a pure realm. Maybe there isn't a pure realm. (laughs) Then we definitely should practice as if the pure realm exists because there are things that will benefit us and it will not hurt us. It will not hurt us. The odds, I mean, we're covered. If there's no pure realm, okay, we've created tremendous good um, imprints for a good rebirth regardless. And if there is one, great. There we go. So no matter what, this is me, a good rebirth is dependent on creating the causes right here, right now in our practice. And aspiring to go to the pure land helps us kind of move along, kind of ups the ante, I think, a little bit, to um, really create those causes to go somewhere, not some vague, oh, I hope I land in some Buddhist family and that they're Buddhists and they start teaching me when I'm two and not when I'm 40, you know, (laughs) right? Right? No, it's a vague wish. But the Pure Land, oh, that's really clear. I want to go. I want to be at Omitabha's feet. I would like that lotus to open soon. I still don't understand how I'm going to generate more um, uh, fortitude. But (laughs) that aside, I'll work on that as a question. To be content to create the causes. So those are the ways I've been working with my doubt. There's more. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more opportunities, but I, I wanted to share that in case you have those questions yourself, <laughs> anybody. Uh, and I learned a long time ago, I haven't had to do this in a long time, but that in practicing the Dharma, the job is to convince ourselves. It's not our teacher's job. I used to demand it. <laughs> Explain it to me so I understand. Venerable was very kind. Um, <laughs> But our job is to convince ourselves. So if it's something we want to to know, to understand, then we're the ones that have to do the effort. And how fortunate that we are and that we have this retreat to be able to do this. It's just amazing. So thank you all here. I'm amazed that we're kind of inside this crystal ball of snow, too. It's like we're in the snow land, pure land. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, and a snow globe. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, may we all uh, meet there. Not like today. Nobody wants to die today. Um, But everybody wants to go to the Pure Land, and anybody wants to go any old time that the Pure Land calls, okay? Okay. (laughs)